Hi, this is Mrs. Cribb, and this is um, a lecture on the Chapter 11a and most of Chapter 11b for the um, for your class. And you need to pull out your notes for this, and, and we're going to get started. The goals for this particular lecture is to just get you to start understanding the nature of intermolecular forces and how they affect physical attributes, phys physical properties of molecules. Okay, we're going to define an intermolecular force, and that is the electrostatic electrostatic attraction electrostatic attractions between molecules. So this is the the attraction between the molecules, not in the middle of the molecules. Um, these forces are much weaker than the bonds that hold the molecule together. Um, they influence the physical properties like is this a solid or liquid or gas at different temperatures. And there's different kinds. We have the dipole dipole and to have a dipole dipole it's got that means it's got to have poles. So it's going to that's we're talking about molecules here that are polar, okay? We have hydrogen bonds. That's another type of um, intermolecular force. And dispersion forces, they could also be called London forces, uh, depends on which textbook you're looking at. Um, I am also going to be going back and forth between this and a Prezi so you can see good pictures. All right, dipole dipole force. Polar molecules align themselves so the positive end of one molecule is near the negative end of another molecule. And the stronger the polarity, the stronger the positive, the stronger the negative, the stronger the attraction that holds it together. Think about a strong um, battery, not sorry, not a battery, but a uh, magnet, a strong magnet and a weak magnet. No, that's not what I mean. Two strong magnets, there we go, um, hold together really strongly and it's difficult to pull them apart. So think of those magnets as molecules and you and they suck together and they stay there. But even though um, they have this polarity, they have the positive and negative, this is still a relatively weak force, the dipole-dipole. So let's look at the Prezi real quick. First of all, this is the Chapter 11 Notes Prezi and right here at the beginning you see the study stack and it has a, whole, a lot of terms in this um, chapter that you'll need to practice and study from, study for, um, using it for the test. And there's also a Quizlet right here now I'm going to be editing the Quizlet a little bit. I'm going to probably add a lot more pictures in there just because um, I like to have a lot of pictures in my Quizlet. Um, this one has a pretty good amount in there, but you'll be able need to be familiar with everything on both of those for the test. And remember, the test for this chapter will be in class. Okay, this is where we started, and we're at the dipole-dipole. They're very weak forces, so we're going to take a couple of pictures, um, look, at, look at some pictures. Remember, polar molecules have positive sides and negative sides, and we have this dipole moment. Um, the arrow points in the direction of that dipole moment. The positive end is the cross part, and the arrow part points to the negative part. So um, oxygen is more electronegative, so it sucks electrons towards it. So this creates a polar molecule. Here we have two dipole moments from the carbon to the to the oxygen and the carbon to the oxygen and they cancel each other out because of the same strength. So this one is not a polar molecule. It would not have a dipole-dipole intermolecular force. Only polar molecules do. The next picture shows you this electrostatic attraction between these molecules. Here's a molecule with a partial negative, that's remember the delta sign, and a partial positive sign. Same molecule and so the negative side of one molecule lines up with the positive sign of the other and they attracted to each other just like two uh, magnets, the north and south ends on two separate magnets. You could think of these as two separate magnets as well. Another picture, this is a particular molecule, ox I mean uh, water, and mirror water is polar, it has a negative side near the oxygens and a positive side near the hydrogens and they align it um, so that the positive side and the negative sides of the two molecules are attracted to each other and that holds the two water molecules close together. Okay, now we're going to go to the second type of um, intermolecular force and it's hydrogen bonds. Now hydrogen bonds are still dipole-dipole. They still are polar bonds. See that it's a special type of dipole and in hydrogen bonds one of the atoms is hydrogen. 
But the other atom, there's only a few choices. The other atom is either fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So that's what constitutes a hydrogen bond, a hydrogen to fluorine, a hydrogen to nitrogen, or a hydrogen to oxygen, okay? These are very, very electronegative. Hydrogen, um, very electronegative, these, these particular types of bonds are. Remember, fluorine's the most electronegative thing, and so it really pulls electrons toward it. Um, then oxygen is the second most electronegative. Okay, hydrogen, ship, um, hydrogen electrons shift a bunch towards the other atom, leaving the proton nucleus of the hydrogen exposed and making it a partially a positive charge. So like if we have hydrogen right here with its one little electron floating around bonded to fluorine over here, this electron shifts way over to fluorine. So um, let's see if we can kind of depict that a little bit. It shifts and it gets way over here. And since it left the hydrogen, it's leaving this area positive and a lot more positive because it's a negative went away. So that's what it's talking about. These intermolecular forces are the very strongest one as far as covalent molecules go. And I have a little um, list of them in order that we'll come across pretty soon. So we're talking about, if we're talking about covalent molecules, hydrogen bonds are super strong, okay? Um, here's an example of some, and I have these in the Prezi as well. Um, we first, the first thing right here, these guys all have hydrogen in them. See that? There's hydrogen, hydrogen, and there's hydrogen. But this is not fluorine, chlor um, nitrogen, or oxygen. So these are not hydrogen bonds as far as uh, intermolecular forces go. They are not hydrogen bonds. And so these guys have much weaker forces. But water is H2O, okay? And so that's, well, here we got, what do we have? We have oxygen and hydrogen. Hydrogen bonded to either fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So this is a hydrogen bond. And like I said, these are the strongest ones. Well, it's holding those molecules together very strongly. So if they hold, they're held together strongly, you have to pull them apart and it takes a lot more work to pull them apart. And so the harder it is to pull them apart, the higher the melting point will be. Well, let's look at these three guys, or these four guys here. This first molecule's mass is 129.6 um, AMUs, or grams if you have a mole of it. Look at the melting point, negative 49 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point is just negative two degrees Celsius, even though it's a pretty big molecule. These other guys still have negative melting points and negative boiling points. But water, which is a small molecule, but because we have water molecules attracted, sorry, here we go, to other water molecules very strongly right through here, this attraction right through here between the molecules are held together strongly, it's hard to pull those molecules apart. So you have to heat them up a lot more, make them wiggle a whole lot more. So the melting point is higher. It's zero degrees Celsius instead of being negative. And the boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius instead of being negative. All right, I'm gonna pull up the um, Prezi to make sure I don't have anything awesome to look at when it comes to this. Oh, I do, there we go. First of all, here's a hydrogen bond. This is an, um, water molecule and another water molecule. See the hydrogen and the oxygen? There's the hydrogen bond right in between the two molecules. It's an intermolecular bond. And here's some more of it, some and more pictures of it. This is a bunch of different water molecules just um, to coming together. And those green dots represent the hydrogen bonds between each of the water molecules, holding them together very strongly into this kind of grid. And because hydrogen bonds have that sort of grid, with the water molecules that is, like this. See, all these water molecules are held together. All these hydrogen bonds are happening. We, that's how we get things like um, surface tension because they're held together so strongly, it's like creating a skin and you have to break those bonds apart to get past that skin. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. And here's that same picture. The first, this one contains the hydrogen bond. This one doesn't contain the hydrogen bonds. And here's something that's really interesting. This is a DNA molecule. And you know, you have to unzip a DNA molecule to, to copy it. Well, 
That means what's holding the two sides of the DNA molecule, the helix together, are hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen and nitrogen right there. Hydrogen and nitrogen, and there's the oxygen. These are all hydrogen bonds, all these little red dots, holding both sides of the DNA molecule together. And so it's a very strong bond, and we this is a, a just another good place to see where it works. Okay, let's go back to our PDF. All right, now we're going to go down to dispersion forces. A dispersion force is re as a result of a very um, temporary dipole. And um, temporary. That means on a, for just a moment. The electrons concentrate momentarily at one end of an atom because they repel the electrons in the nearby molecule. This happens for just an instant. So a, a dispersion force is a polar force but it's just a very weak one and it is um, very temporary. It just happens for a split second and then it goes away. Okay, Dispersion forces occur between all molecules, but they are the only, only intermolecular force acting on non-polar molecules. So when we have a non-polar molecule, the only intermolecular force is a dispersion force. It's very weak and it's very temporary. Okay, so let me see if I have um, some pictures of the dispersion force for you. I think I do. All right, this is what we just filled in. All right, here we have a dispersion force, an example. Um, we start off with two molecules that are not polar. They're perfectly even all the way around and they come towards each other and one of them the electrons decide to shift to what to the left all of a sudden. It's just you know randomly moving around and it randomly happens that the electrons are concentrated over here. So that's a very temporary dipole, a very temporary time when it's polar. Well if it's temporarily negative over here and temporarily positive over here, well this atom that's close to it is going or this molecule rather is going to react. Because remember, likes repel and opposites attract. So if opposites attract and likes repel, the like things over here are going to shift to the other side and the opposite things are going to shift near it so they can be attracted to each other. And that's what happens. Then like things, the positive moved away from it to repel and the negative, the electrons moved toward it. And so it caused a very temporary time when there's a positive and negative charge on both of these molecules. But in the next instance, this could shift the other direction and that could shift the other direction. So um, dispersion forces are just very, very momentary. Now we're going to go through this part right here on our notes. Larger molecules have more electrons. And so the more electrons they have, the more electrons that it can move around and go back and forth between um, the molecule, I mean go back and forth inside the molecule causing that very temporary shift. So we're going to draw these three molecules. This first one is methane, which we've seen before. It's CH4. It's not very big. The um, Lewis dot structure for methane we've seen a lot too. Looks like this. Okay. So we only have, elect, the electrons that are doing a lot of moving are in the hydrogens. And so each hydrogen has one electron. So we really have just four electrons that are shifting back and forth inside this molecule. Normally, th this is a nonpolar molecule. It's tetrahedral. We have, we draw it like this. And, uh, you know, try to do 3D and fail pretty regularly at it, but we attempt it. It's everything's evenly dispersed. It is not polar. Okay, it's not polar. It um, has a very weak um, dispersion force, though. Dispersion force happens. The electrons, four of them or so, shift back and forth inside the molecule. Because of this, it's easy to take this molecule apart. So it's a gas at room temperature because it doesn't require a whole lot of heat. At room temperature, it will very quickly fly apart. Now octane, oct means eight. So octane is C8H18. And it looks like this, eight carbons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it has 18 hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 
12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. At the end of every one of those lines is a hydrogen. There they are. And so this has about 18 electrons that can fly back and forth inside this molecule temporarily. And so that's more, this one only had four electrons to go back and forth. Okay, but this one has 18 electrons that can go back and forth, causing a negative side and a positive side. So this is a slightly stronger molecule as far as dispersion forces go. And so if you had two of these guys next to each other, like one of the octanes over here and another octane over here, the dispersion force in the middle of these guys, right here, would be stronger than the dispersion force of the, of the methane gas because it would have a positive and a negative 18. Uh, you know, not really, but something like that. A positive and a negative would be stronger. So that means they're, they're connected to each other more strongly, and so it takes more energy to pull them apart. So it, they are a liquid. Octane is a liquid at room temperature. And octane is what you find in your gasoline. You, you've heard of high octane gas. All right, so that molecule is bigger than the last molecule, right? And so now I'm going to draw um, octadecane. And this is what it looks like. Now at the end of every line is a hydrogen, but I'm not going to draw all of them. There are 38. 38 hydrogens. Um, and that means, you know, 38 electrons. So here is an octadecane. It's bigger than the last molecule, and it could have 38 electrons over here, making a big um, negative charge. I was just about right positive. Um, a big negative charge, causing the other side to be a big positive charge for just a moment. And then it could switch the other way around. So right next to it would be another octadecane. And in between it would be that intermolecular force that's pulling the dispersion force, pulling these guys together. The negative side of one would be attracted to the positive side of the other octadecane, but it's more strongly attracted than the last one. That means it's harder to pull them apart. So it takes more energy to pull them apart. So at, at room temperature, we don't have enough energy to pull them apart. So they're solids. They're even cl more um, close together than the liquids are from octadecane, I mean from octane. So that's dispersion forces. The Basically the bigger the molecule gets, the stronger the dispersion force is, and the harder it is to pull the molecules apart. Okay, so now let's look at um, these molecules down here, and we're going to, it says draw the Lewis dots for the following and list the types of intermolecular forces that, have, that are, are going to affect each one of them. So um, I'm going to draw them, and then um, we'll talk about it. First, we have the Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide, and there it is, the Lewis dot for carbon dioxide. So what we need to do, now we're talking here about covalent. This Carbon dioxide is covalent because metal, nonmetal, ionic, but carbon and oxygen are both nonmetals. So this is a covalent molecule. Um, we have to evaluate if it's polar. So that's the first question. Um, we have to know if it's covalent or ionic, and we have to know if it's polar, and we have to know does it have hydrogen bonds. And so those are the questions we have to ask when we're figuring these things out. So here we have carbon dioxide, and I've shown you a picture. It has polar bonds, but it's not polar because the bond pulling from carbon to oxygen and the other carbon to oxygen cancel each other out because this is a linear molecule. So it's not polar, so the only type of intermolecular force that A, carbon dioxide can have is dispersion because everything has dispersion. So what about hydrogen fluoride? Well, I just told you everything has dispersion, but let's look at hydrogen fluoride is easy. You draw it like this. It has a positive end towards hydrogen and a negative end pointing to fluorine because fluorine is the most electronegative and pulls the electrons to it. So is it, um, is it polar? Yes, so it's going to have dipole-dipole because it's polar. Um, everything has dispersion, so we can always write that one down. And then does it have hydrogen bonds? Well, let's see what the, the definition was. To have a hydrogen bond, you have to have hydrogen bonded to 
fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. So it's bonded to fluorine right here. So it does have hydrogen bonds. So that's the other type of intermolecular force that um, hydrogen fluoride molecules would have. So this one has a lot of, this, and this is very strong. This has a lot of intermolecular forces. What about bromine chloride, still covalent? We have bromine and chlorine, and one of them is more electronegative than the other. It goes fluorine, bromine, uh, fluorine, uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. There we go, I put them in order. So chlorine is closer to fluorine. So that means bromine is farther away. Chlorine is more electronegative. So there is a positive and a negative side to this molecule. And so that means it's polar. If it's polar, it has dipole, dipole. And I said, everything has dispersion. So if I ever ask you what the intermolecular forces are in a molecule, you can automatically tell me they have dispersion and you'll get part of the points. But what else does it have? This one also has dipole, dipole. Now, does it have hydrogen bonds? Well, no, it can't because there's not a single hydrogen atom in here. So this one does not have hydrogen bonds. Okay, let's look at this next example. Based on the bonds within each molecule and the forces that um, hold these molecules together, predict which compound has a higher boiling point. So what we're saying here is if I, I need to boil this stuff, I want to move the molecules so fast that they separate and they turn into a gas. And so the more, the harder it is to pull them apart, the higher the boiling point will be. So we're going to evaluate them. Now one thing you need to know is if you have a molecule um, that's ionic, the forces that hold ionic molecules together are the strongest. Then comes those really strong covalent. All these guys down here are for covalent molecules, okay? But ionic is stronger than covalent. And then covalent gets kind of broken apart into these different categories. So what we're going to do is look at both of them. We have potassium fluoride. This is a metal and a nonmetal. So this is ionic. And then we have bromine fluoride. And this is two nonmetals. It's covalent. So that means ionic is stronger. So that means it's like two strong magnets held together. It takes a lot of energy to pull it apart. So this one is going to have the higher boiling point. Potassium fluoride will. And that's because it has ionic forces. What does bromine fluoride have? The same thing as bromine chloride. Bromine fluoride is polar, so it has dipole, dipole, and it has dispersion. All right, what about these two guys? Well, first we have chlorine. Remember, it's one of the diatomic elements, and it has two of them. All right, it is nonpolar. Um, I'm sorry, it's covalent, and it's not, pol it's not polar because, look, it's exactly the same atom. So it's not polar. Since it's not polar, the only force holding this together is dispersion. And remember, dispersion is the weakest kind. It's way down here. And then we have ICL. ICL was just like um, bromine uh, fluoride, both nonmetals. Um, iodine is down here below chlorine, so iodine's weaker, so it points here. So this is polar, so it has dipole, dipole, and um, it also has dispersion because they all have dispersion. So see, it has two types of intermolecular forces. That means it's held together more strongly than the chlorines. So ICL would have the higher boiling point because it is harder to pull them apart. Okay? All right. Let's move on to 11B. Now I'm going to go check the, the um, Prezi and see if I had anything else. Oh, I did. I remember that. This is another picture of intermolecular um, forces, the dispersion force for a, a nonpolar molecule. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. This is hexane, two hexanes. And um, they're normally not polar. Normally it's identical all the way around, but you can temporarily move the electrons to one side, causing a positive side and a negative side to form. And that causes the next molecule to, to line up so that its electrons 
go on the same side so there's attraction between it. This is the dispersion force um, and the bigger the molecule the stronger that force is. Okay, we just did all these and I showed you this right here. It's very important you remember that. And that brings us to 11b. Whoops, wrong place. Here we go, 11b. Now, according to the kinetic molecular theory, now what does kinetic mean again? We, we have this word a lot. Well, kinetic is movement. And so if, if you have um, movement energy, so kinetic molecular theory of matter, particles and solids are always moving. Everything's moving. Everything's vibrating. You're moving and vibrating. The lower the temperature, though, the slower you vibrate, okay? The higher the temperature, the um, faster the vibrations are going to be. And because they have more kinetic energy, movement energy, strong intermolecular forces stifle these vibrations. Now, what does that mean? It just means if they're held together very strongly and they're wiggling around, the, the more the stronger they're held together, the more the less wiggling they can do. Um, kind of think about a kid. This is kind of weird, but you know, a, ch a child uh, duct tape to a chair or something. They may be wiggling around the chair, but the stronger you can duct tape them to the chair, the less they'll move. But don't do that because that would be cruel. I'm, um, we can also do like the Red Rover idea. If you hold somebody with your your forearms strongly it's harder to break it apart you're stifling the movement there okay now sodium chloride is ionic because that's a metal and a nonmetal you know positive and a negative um, and so remember the um, order was that ionic is stronger even than the hydrogen bonds and hydrogen bonds are stronger than the dipole dipole and that's stronger than dispersion. Okay, so the strongest one here is this ionic, and sodium chloride is ionic. And so that means sodium chloride is held together very strongly. It's like held together in crystal. And because it's held together so strongly, it's hard to break it apart and melt it. It has, it's a still a solid at 108, I'm oh, sorry, 100, no, 801, sorry, 801 degrees Celsius. All right. Now bromine is obviously not ionic, it's, it's um, covalent, and it's not polar because it's exactly the same atom on both sides. So it's very easy to pull it apart. It's not being held strongly. The only thing holding bromine together is dispersion forces, that temporary shifting of the electrons back and forth. So it melts very quickly. It turns from a solid into a liquid at negative deg 7 degrees Celsius. So here, ionic um, is a solid all the way up to 801 degrees Celsius, but here bromine would melt at negative 7 degrees Celsius. Solids have little motion, so there are very low rates of diffusion. I bet you didn't realize they would diffuse at all, but they do, and um, very few atoms at a time, and they are not permeable. Permeable. You can't permeate it. You can't get through it. You can't push things through it. Think about um, a semi-permeable membrane that allows only some things to come in and out. Okay, Solids are higher in density except for water and I'll show you a chart in a minute about that. Um, they have a fixed shape, meaning you're not going to change their shape. Um, a fixed volume, that's the amount of space it takes up, and they resist compression. Now this is all something that should be review. We've, I know we've gone over this already earlier in the year, but we're reviewing it because um, the intermolecular forces are largely responsible for these particular properties. Solids are usually, and this is an important thing, they are usually 10% denser than a liquid. So a solid is usually 10% denser. Water though is, is the exception to the rule. It is the most dense at 4 degrees Celsius and the Lord put that together that way so that ice would float because um, if it was more dense as this ice it would sink to the bottom. I'm going to show you a picture on this one. I know I have this. Okay, first of all, I, um, I guess I didn't point to this picture but I wanted to point to this picture. This is a representation of sodium chloride, guys. Okay, um, 
one of them, the purple is uh, sodium and the green is chlorine, and that's the formula unit, the simplest ratio. And they are attracted to other ones because it's positive and negatives, and they form this crystal. And this is a very strong bond. That's why these strong arms are coming out here, holding it together, making it very, very difficult to melt sodium chloride. Now let's look at this chart about water's density. So this is the density of water. This notice here, it's four degrees Celsius. At four degrees Celsius, that's when water is the least dense. Okay, it's more dense right here as it's it's um, getting colder or actually warming up. It becomes less dense, and then it gets dense again as it gets warmer. So it's the it's the least dense. Sorry, it's the most dense at four degrees Celsius, and the least dense as it gets higher. It gets uh, hotter. I'm thinking backwards for a moment there. So the most um, dense part of water, of ice, is when it's really cold water, it's dense. But when it reaches 4 degrees Celsius, it's the most dense. Um, when it's 0 degrees Celsius, that's when it's ice right there. It's less dense. The ice is less dense than the 4 degrees Celsius water. That means the ice is going to float here right here. Warm water is sinking and the um, ice is floating. So let's make sure we get that straight. When the water is zero degrees Celsius, right here, it's less dense. The density is 0 0.9998. So that means it's going to sit on top of the higher density water. Four degrees Celsius is the most dense. I may have said it backwards before. Um, so water is the most dense at four degrees. That means right underneath the ice will be the most dense water, okay? All right, and that keeps um, ice floating rather than sinking. It saves a life because otherwise ice would sink to the bottom. It would freeze from the bottom up. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about crystalline solids. So let's get back over here. Crystalline solid, um, Natural orderly shape. Crystalline solids have a natural orderly shape, a regular 3D pattern, so they're orderly, very orderly, just like that crystal of salt I showed you a minute ago. They have a 3D pattern and they have very sharp angles and edges. Um, ionic and metallic solids are usually a crystalline solid. Salt crystals, for example, are crystalline solids. Um, so let's go back and look at the Prezi now so we can see some of the pictures about that. So here we go. This is a crystalline solid. Sharp edges. Very orderly shape though. And here this is an example of one. This is just like salt. Sodium and chlorine. It forms this little pattern which we're going to call a lattice and it causes edges to form. So think about salt. If you look at salt underneath the um, microscope you could see all those edges forming. Now a crystalline solid has more than one possible shape and so let's go back to the notes for just a moment and cover those. Amorphous, A means not, that's that prefix that means not. Morph would be a shape, right? If you morph into something you change in your shape. So amorphous does not have a certain shape. An amorphous solid, no distinct shape or pattern. Covalent compounds are sometimes amorphous. Um, an example of an amorphous solid would, would be glass. If you drop a glass, it shatters into all kinds of pieces, and those pieces are not usually the same shape. They can be in chunks or little shards, and so that's this is an example there. Um, a crystalline solid like quartz has an exactly perfect grid that it makes. This would not be amorphous. This would be one with an, um, a very repeatable pattern. But an amorphous solid like glass, notice that the pattern is not there. It's sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's wider apart. And so both of these guys are silicon, silicon dioxide, but one of them's quartz and one of them's glass. Here's another picture of it. A crystalline solid with a perfect repeating pattern over and over and over again, but an amorphous solid, A, not morph, no shape, no shape solid, no perfectly um, orderly shape solid like glass has no perfect pattern just like the other one had. Okay. 
Now we're going to talk about melting point and freezing point. So let's go down here. Melting point. The melting point is the temperature at which a solid changes into a liquid and the freezing point is the temperature at which a liquid becomes a solid and you know both of these things but I uh, hope you realize this for pure substances like just pure water this is exactly the same thing and what determines whether it turns to a solid or a liquid is whether I'm adding energy or taking energy away so we have something called a warming curve for crystalline substances show clear plateaus that correspond to sharp melting points and then amorphous solids do not have a clear plateau warning curve I mean sorry warming curve so I'm going to draw these and I want you to draw them into your notes okay um, so first we're going to do one for a crystalline substance that has clear plateaus okay what we have here this down here will be energy that we're adding okay and Um, what happens is we heat it up and this over here is going to be the temperature okay and as we increase the temperature it turns and then it turns and it turns like this so let me start off down here as a solid and um, I really need to make the edges a little bit more jaggy so hold on just one second or I'm going to redraw that like a crystalline solid. Okay, it goes straight up and then we have a plateau. That's what a plateau is, a flat area. And then it goes straight up again or kind of straight up and then another plateau and then straight up again. So this would be for a crystalline solid. I needed to make sure I distinguished my areas. Now this first portion of the graph we have um, usually a, a, a solid of some sort it's a solid as the temperature goes up so it starts off like if it's a ice it would be zero degrees Celsius and when it got up to I mean sorry maybe it's negative uh, five degrees Celsius ice and then it got up to here it's now a zero degrees Celsius that would be the melting point so we'd start off at this spot right here as um, zero degrees Celsius solid and then we get to this side and we would have zero degrees Celsius liquid and we would have added in all this energy in here all this energy so all this energy that we're adding to it is being used to pull the molecules apart but the temperature is staying the same and that is the if I'm adding the energy in I'm melting it but if I'm taking the energy out of it I'm turning it into a solid notice the melting point and the freezing point then would be the same the melting point would be zero degrees Celsius and the freezing point is zero degrees Celsius. It depends if I'm adding energy or taking energy away. Now after that I have a liquid and I have a liquid for water I have a liquid and it's at zero degrees Celsius here and I heat that liquid up until it reaches a hundred degrees Celsius. So I'm going to just change the color but in this area I'm still adding in more energy and so now I've raised the temperature up and when I reach to this spot I have 100 degrees Celsius liquid and over here I'm now going to turn it into 100 degrees Celsius gas so this is the um, boiling point of the water of pure water the boiling point and the condensation point is going to be the same okay so at this point all the energy that's being put into it is being used to break apart the molecules from a hot liquid turn it into a the same temperature gas so this is the warming curve for a crystalline solid with with strong plateaus right here these are the plateaus okay now amorphous solids don't have the same kind of warming curve and why is that if we go back up here and look well, let's go back to the Prezi and look at the pictures. We can see that um, in a crystalline solid, all the bonds are exactly the same. And that means it takes exactly the same amount of energy to break them apart. But over here, we have very different bonds. We have some that are closer, some that are farther apart. So it takes varying amounts of energy, different kinds of energy or different amounts of energy to pull it apart. So we're not going to have the uh, very 
um, nice neat warming curve. We're going to have a, a more abstract looking warming curve. So for a crystalline solid, sorry, an amorphous solid, that's the next one we're going to do right down here, the amorphous solid, it would be the curvy shape. We got to curve it, you know, it's, it's very curvy when it changes from one to the other. So that's the main thing you need to know about the difference between both of these is that an amorphous solid requires varying amounts of energy, different kinds of energy to turn it from a liquid to a gas or from a from a solid to a liquid. And so its warming curve would not be distinct, but a crystalline solid would have these very distinct flat areas on the warming curve and that is for the crystalline solids for pure substances the melting point and the freezing points are identical. Exact same thing. The last two things we're going to cover in this section, because we're going to stop um, at the end of right here, is sublimation and deposition. And we have done this before, I know. Sublimation is just when you go straight from a solid to a gas, and deposition is when you go straight from a gas to a solid. Hopefully you remember the iodine experiment we did earlier in the year. Okay. So I want to, oh, this is a different curve, just so you know. This though is a cooling curve. Notice that means it's in the opposite direction. So this would be a cooling curve of an amorphous solid, but this would be a cooling curve of a crystalline solid because there's that plateau, that flat area. That's the distinctive characteristic of a crystalline solid's warming curve or cooling curve. All right, so this is where we are right now. And here's some pictures to remind you. This is sublimation going straight from a gas, I mean a solid to a gas. This is a dry ice, CO2. And this is what we did in class that time. We had purple um, gas formed from gray looking iodine crystals. So we had the, so the solid um, crystals down here. They went straight to this purple gas. And I put ice in a watch glass up here and it reformed the crystals at the top. So we had sublimation down here and deposition reforming the crystals at the top up there. Okay, so that is where we're going to stop for this particular video and we'll pick up from there in class. See you soon.